Hi everyone, welcome to Hub Bytes. I'm Sunil Rege, consultant psychiatrist. As many of you know, this is the channel where we cover all things psychiatry and mental health related. So if that's your thing and something you're interested in, don't forget to subscribe. Today, what I'm gonna be covering is Autism Spectrum Disorder, ASD. It's a neurodevelopmental disorder, which means that more and more children are being diagnosed with Autism Spectrum Disorder, which means that we need to understand how to support them and also when they enter adulthood, um, psychiatry as a whole needs to recognize how to support individuals with autism spectrum disorder because it's something that we don't know enough about. So let's jump into autism spectrum disorder, see what it is, how is it diagnosed, and what are the evidence-based strategies that we use in treatment. So autism spectrum disorder is a complex developmental condition we would call it a neurodevelopmental condition involving persistent challenges with social communication, restricted interest and repetitive behavior. Previously, they had speech and language issues in there that's been taken out now. So it's really about social communications and the behavioral aspect. Now, while autism is considered a lifelong disorder, the degree of impairment in functioning because of these challenges varies between individuals with autism. So you see a really big range. Autism spectrum disorder begins in early childhood and eventually causes problems functioning in society, socially, in school and at work, for example. Often children will show signs and symptoms of autism within the first year. Autism spectrum disorder affects children of all races and nationalities, but certain factors can increase a child's risk. And these may include the sex of a child, there is a gender difference. We know that um, boys are about four times more likely to develop autism spectrum disorder than girls are. And you might remember when we did the ADHD video, we talked about this uh, female protective hypothesis. So estrogen can be protective while testosterone results in what we call a delayed lateralization theory where testosterone can impede the development. So what happens in males is that one hemisphere develops uh, at one point, whilst the other one has this retardation, so delayed lateralization. So what happens is in some cases, this lateralization, so right hemisphere developing, the left hemisphere is retarded, and in some cases that might continue to be retarded, or there might be insults that prevents the development of the left hemisphere, resulting in neurodevelopmental abnormalities. So this is why ADHD, ASD, autism spectrum disorder, there's often coexisting, and ASD hypothesis is very, very similar in terms of delayed lateralization, explaining why it's more common in males, because testosterone is linked to that delayed lateralization theory. Then we have family history. Very similar to ADHD, we find that uh, families who have one child with autism spectrum disorder have an increased risk of having another child with the disorder. Often we'll find it's heritable, so often we'll find someone with autism spectrum disorder will have a family member with autism spectrum disorder as well. It's not uncommon for parents or relatives of a child with autism spectrum disorder to have minor problems with social or communication skills themselves or to engage in certain behaviors typical of the disorder. Other disorders. Now the thing is, you know, when we think about genetics, we don't have clear genes as such that you know tell us if this gene's present the individual is going to develop this so in psychiatry it's multiple genes with small effects uh, that add on to the disorder unless of course we're looking at um, diseases such as Huntington's disease we know the chromosome we know the it's autosomal dominant we know the trinucleotide repeats here it's a bit different it's possibly multiple genes with small effects that cumulatively act uh, in the genesis of the disorder. So when we think about children with certain medical conditions have higher than normal risk of autism spectrum disorder, autism-like symptoms. Extremely preterm babies as well. So babies born before 26 weeks of gestation may have a greater risk. Uh, again, part of the neurodevelopment. Parents' ages, there may be a connection. Again, there's a link between children born to older parents and autism spectrum disorder. But again, more research is required to establish this link conclu conclusively. I'm going into a little bit more detail here, but genome-wide linkages, this is one way of studying genetics and the risk of psychiatric disorders. So genome-wide linkages studies have identified some susceptibility genes on chromosomes 2Q, 7Q, and 15Q, and 16P. Now, some of these genes have been given names. So n 2 
was the first gene to be proposed to increase ASD susceptibility. It's a transcription factor that plays a role in the development of the central nervous system. So we know transcription is DNA to RNA. Translation is the next step, RNA to protein particularly in the form of serotonergic and noradrenergic nuclei in the mid and hind brain. So you can see here, there's some abnormality in this transcription factor, uh, which plays a role in the development of the central nervous system. Then we have the UBE3A. This is involved in ubiquitin proteasome pathway, where it plays a role in synaptic development, the development of synapses. You know, and we know that it's 500 trillion synapses in the brain. It is suggested to play a role in the regulation of the circadian clock. So this is where most likely that link between circadian rhythm disturbances, ASD, you know, it's part of treatment, sleep disturbances are very, very common in ASD and similarly in ADHD as well. Fragile X syndrome, expansion of the CGG trinucleotide repeat in the FMR1 gene and has been linked to about one to 3% of children with autism. Now, fragile X occurs in males and is the most common inherited intellectual disability. The reason is because in females you have XX, so the other X chromosome compensates, so you don't get the full phenotype. In males, they only have one X chromosome, so if there's that abnormality in that X chromosome, they develop the phenotype. Phenotype is the external sort of appearance, behavior, etc. And you can see about linked to one to three percent of children with autism. Neurotransmitters are involved as well. GABA receptor subunits, we know GABA is inhibitory. Then we have environmental components, and often it might be a gene environment interaction. Maternal infection, maternal rubella is the best example, which has been shown to increase the risk of autism. However, the MMR vaccine has all but eliminated this environmental risk, and there's no evidence linking other viral infections such as influenza. Now, as you know, there was this huge controversy with Andrew Wakefield, MMR vaccine and autism. This is unequivocally false. There is no link between MMR vaccine and autism. Maternal antibodies, it has been proposed that circulating maternal antibodies directed against fetal brain proteins may also be a risk factor. So autoimmune sort of components there. Medications, the first indications that a drug administered during pregnancy could be associated with increased risk of autism was thalidomide. Now, obviously we know thalidomide was associated with significant congenital malformations taken out completely. Environmental toxins, pesticides. Now these are links, uh, pesticides to car exhaust fumes to cigarette smoke, all has been proposed as risk factors. No conclusive evidence really. Although the link is still unclear, there has been small increases in the rates of ASD in families that live close to either a motorway or a farm. Again, these are just signals. We don't conclusively know these aspects. What we do know is again, that uh, childhood isolation, growing up in foster homes, for example, uh, there are some links, particularly in, so we know that where there has been deprivation, social deprivation, so the mania, for example, when children were taken away, that some links with those neurodevelopmental abnormalities, autism was, was present. So deprivation, uh, social deprivation, attachment difficulties, again, links. Now, recognize that when we think about these risk factors, these are signals, and causality in medicine is very, very difficult to establish conclusively because we need large numbers to be able to say this signal is accurate. And what are the neurodevelopmental abnormalities that have been identified? We have, there has been links with dysfunctional amygdala, as we can see here, amygdala. This is sort of amygdala is associated with fear and aggression, also associated with emotions. Dysfunctional prefrontal cortex, that's here. This is the prefrontal cortex associated with, you know, executive function, attention, concentration. Nucleus accumbens. Now, nucleus accumbens is the reward pathway. So the nucleus accumbens, as you can see here, this is another important part that's been shown to be affected. And the cerebellar circuit, so the links between the cerebellum and the cerebrum. Cerebellar abnormalities have been quite consistently identified in individuals with autism. Some studies showing an enlarged um, cerebellum as well. So again, they're quite heterogeneous. So symptoms of ASD can range from the following. Problems with communication and social interaction, one. And two, restricted or repetitive patterns of behavior activities. So some patients with autism might experience additional symptoms such as delayed movement, language or cognitive skills. Seizures may occur. Gastrointestinal symptoms like constipation or diarrhea. Excessive worry or stress. Unusual levels of fear. Hyperactivity, inattentive or impulsive behaviors. ADHD overlap. Unexpected emotional reactions. Often we find exaggerated emotional reaction in response to change, for example. Unusual eating habits or preferences. Sometimes they can have heightened sensitivity with certain foods as well. Taste and textures. Uh, unusual sleep patterns. And symptoms of ASD typically become clearly evident during early childhood between ages 12 and 24 months. However, symptoms may appear earlier 
or later as well. So how is it diagnosed? So what's really important here is that it is a specialist, specialized assessment. So in children, often a child and adolescent specialist will either carry out, there are certain scales and observation schedules. So for example, the autism diagnostic interview and the autism diagnostic observation schedule will be carried out. So often videos of interaction of the child, observation. So it's a really structured assessment that's carried out. This is not just about a, a hunch or a suspicion. This is a, a detailed assessment to identify whether autism spectrum disorder exists. And that's why during in adults, it can be a little bit more challenging because the question is, you know, was there the autism spectrum aspects present early on? So what we find is in DSM, it divides symptoms of ASD into two categories, problems with communication and social interaction and restricted or repetitive patterns of behavior or activities. These are the two main domains and they must experience symptoms in both these categories. So what are some of the examples of, you know, communication and social interaction difficulties? Decreased sharing of interest with others, difficulty appreciating their own or others' emotions. And we'll look at this as known as theory of mind. Aversion to maintaining eye contact. Gaze avoidance is often a feature. Lack of proficiency with the use of nonverbal gestures. Stilted or scripted speech. Interpreting abstract ideas literally, so concrete thinking and difficulty making friends or keeping them. Now, these restricted or repetitive patterns of behavior may include the inflexibility of behavior, extreme difficulty coping with change, being overly focused on niche subjects to the exclusion of others. Now, this can sometimes be beneficial because they can excel in certain fields. Expecting others to be equally interested in those subjects. Difficulty tolerating changes in routine and new experiences. Sensory hypersensitivity. This is quite common, aversion to loud noises, sometimes textures, um, all of these things might be present. Stereotypical movements such as hand flapping, rocking, spinning, arranging things, often toys in a very particular manner. So all of these things, again, this is not just about one thing present, it's present across the board not just in a particular setting, it's often across settings and pervasive. So how is it treated? Now, with treatment really, I would say that it is, you know, children, adolescents, it's different, adults, it's different, and it's very heterogeneous, it needs to be individualized and it's specialized. So this is just in general, some of the things. Applied behavioral analysis, social skills training, speech and language therapy, if speech and language is a real um, prominent uh, problem. Occupational therapy, parent management training, special education services and treating co-occurring conditions. And because we have these specialized treatments, often a referral is made to specialized child and adolescent services or specialized autism spectrum services. Now with medication, medication often we want as last resort in um, children and adolescents, but a child psychiatrist can evaluate for appropriate comorbid conditions. So if depression, anxiety is present and it's very prominent, that antidepressants may be needed. If ADHD is present, ADHD medications may be needed, stimulants, non-stimulants. Sleep disturbances are present, guanfacine, clonidine, etc., may be needed. So for example, autism-related irritability can be reduced by some antipsychotics. Aggression, mood stabilizers may be required, or low-dose antipsychotic, you know, risperidone, for example, may be re needed in aggression, irritability, etc. Now, several complementary and alternative interventions involving special diets and supplements have been tried over the years but there's no conclusive sort of compelling evidence to recommend any such specific interventions. But it's not uncommon for parents to say, you know, this works or that works. And as we say, we can't ever dismiss this thing just because, you know, absence of evidence isn't evidence of absence. So it's really about having an open mind to understand um, how these things may link to psychiatric disorders. And there's no doubt nutrition, diet plays an important part in psychiatry. So research into these types of intervention continues and parents and caregivers interested in them should discuss them with the child's treating clinician. Now for adults, it's a bit different. For adults with autism spectrum disorder, we focus on the primary um, presentation. They could present with substance use, they could present with medical conditions, they could present with uh, low-grade psychosis, bipolar, depression, anxiety, trauma, etc. So we think about treating that and adapting their the treatment to 
their spectrum that might be present. So if social anxiety is there, we try to consider social skills training or CBT or anxiety management. So I talked about theory of mind. So this is, you know, some of the latest evidence that we have. Theory of mind, also known as mentalizing or mind reading. So the ability to put oneself into someone else's shoes refers to the ability to represent mental states such as beliefs, desires, and intentions to predict and explain others and own behavior. So the ability to empathize, the ability to recognize what the other person might be feeling, or that's known as theory of mind. So the EU AIMS Longitudinal European Autism Project, known as LEAP, is to date the largest multi-center, multidisciplinary observational study worldwide that aims to identify and validate stratification biomarkers for autism spectrum disorder. It has been considered that biological mechanisms may be different in autism spectrum disorder. As an example, by studying the excitatory inhibitory system in the brain, so this is the glutamate GABA pathway, glutamate excitatory GABA inhibitory. Autism may be described as something that may affect how balance occurs in the glutamate and GABA pathways. However, in vivo, which is live samples of the living brain, reveal little consistency across the studies published, whether in children or ad adults. And this is what I meant by the heterogeneous heterogeneity. So many heterogeneous findings, difficult to apply then to the whole group of individual autism spectrum disorder. A proof of concept study recently showed that responsivity to the EI, excitatory inhibitory challenge, is different in adults with autism and that the autistic brain is pharmacologically atypical. This unusual EI responsivi uh, responsivity in ASD may explain other paradoxical findings from studies of the way people with ASD responds to, respond to EI acting medication, for example, GABA-A benzodiazepine receptor agonists. So we know benzodiazepines promote GABA. Valproate, for example, promotes GABA, uh, mood stabilizers, typically have an inhibitory effect in non-ASD populations. So for example, we know they reduce glutamate, but can sometimes cause excitation in individuals with ASD. So benzodiazepines can have paradoxical reactions in people with ASD. The cause of EI responsivity differences is not known. And ASD has been conceptualized as a development disconnection syndrome with underconnectivity between the prefrontal cortex and the posterior brain network. So you remember I talked about dysfunction in the uh, prefrontal cortex, uh, amygdala, cerebellum, all posterior parts, nucleus accumbens, right? So it might be linked to the disconnectivity. And Rilisol was able to establish functional connectivity between the two areas in high functioning adults with autism, but no high functioning adults with autism. So Rilisol Rilizol is a neuroprotective drug that blocks glutamagic transmission in the CNS. So there may be some promising therapies that might be coming up later on. In conclusion, using scans, we found that the EI flux and functional connectivity of the prefrontal cortex are differentially regulated in adults with ASD compared with controls. Importantly, inhibitory tone and functional connectivity can be shifted pharmacologically and even in adults with ASD, which means Rilisol may be a, a promising therapy. Hope that it's been helpful. If you liked it, uh, leave us a like. Thank you so, so much for watching. I really appreciate it. Uh, you watching this video and of course supporting our channel. I look forward to seeing you in another edition of Hot Bites in the future. Uh, See you next time. Bye-bye.